I am joined by a friend of mine, and proud to say a friend, and I think probably one of the coolest dudes in golf, Brady Riggs, top 100 teacher. Um, and, dude, you just, like, to me, are one of the coolest and best performance coaches in the game. So I appreciate you coming on and talking with me. Totally my pleasure. Happy to be here, and it's a subject that I really believe strongly about. So let's get it going. Yeah, man, and, you know, so I'd, I'd just like to dive right in, obviously. And, um, you know, like I was just telling you when we were kind of arranging this, you know, I just don't think that the things that matter for players to get better um, are discussed enough. And I just think there's a problem in golf in that, and I know you and I have talked about that. Um, but, you know, honestly, I just – I personally, Brady, don't think – enough golfers especially the ones that are trying to get to a high level know how to get there and really how to train to get there so like I believe that you know there's an issue in you know how players are tr uh, like training and trying to translate that to the course like if you had kind of to start off I mean what do you think is the major issue in that disconnect from players just going out on the range and trying to get better well, I think people spend a lot of time trying to look a certain way on the range instead of trying to figure out how they can score better. You know, then the two don't always translate to each other very well. So I think that people are caught up in mechanics of the swing, which is fine to try and make the ball striking better, but they have no idea how to plan their way around a golf course, how to practice their areas they're kind of weak in, how to even – sort of define what those areas are by doing some data collection. And because of that, don't see people scoring a lot better, even sometimes if they are swinging better. So it's really just having a, a kind of a holistic view to how to score better on the golf course and what it takes to do that, that people are missing. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, because the, the national handicap, especially if we're just talking average golfers, hasn't really gone down. But look at all the technology and the information that we have swing-wise. But, you know, every t uh, corner we turn, you know, we're seeing swing stuff and swing mechanics and swing like this. And now we're seeing different swing styles. And, you know, so with that kind of stuff, and even if just for a player to get a technique that suits them and can really they can be confident in, you know, I mean – how often are you seeing people trying to jump from tip to tip? And like, what does it take if we're just talking on the technique side of things? You know, what does it take for a player to really hone what they're going to do and own it? Well, they need to stick with the things that matter, you know, the things that create consistency. And that's first, you got to be able to get the ball started generally on the line that you were hoping to start it on. And if it's going to curve, you have to have a predictable curve. So, Managing the face path relationship is critical to having control over the ball. That's number one. Number two is you got to hit the middle of the face. You know, that's really important. It's got to be pretty much in the center most of the time, or you won't be able to control the ball at all. Then you need to have the bottom of the arc in the right place so that it's out in front of the ball with the iron and basically, in, you know, after you hit the ball with the driver, you want to be hitting up on the driver, down on the iron a little. And then you need some speed. And that's kind of it. You know, you're controlling face and pass, center contact, bottom of the arc and speed. And anything you're doing, you should be able to answer the question, why am I doing that, based on one of those five ingredients. And if you're not, you're wasting your time. You know, if it's just why I see Tiger looks like this or, you know, I read in a magazine I should be doing this move, then it doesn't really – it doesn't equate to you hitting the ball better. It's got to answer one of those five questions – or you're wasting your time with the technique. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so Brady, like one of my big mantras is, you know, I, I really push strongly that technique and skill is different. So like you just went through those things and, you know, that's kind of what I say is a little simplified version is, you know, technique is to basically hit the ball solid and move it forward. You know, but skill um, in my definition is now controlling the ball. Can you hit the shot on command? Can you control the trajectory of the spin? Can you hit off of side hills and stuff like that? I mean, would you agree with that or you have a different opinion? No, I think we're saying the same thing. You know, we, it's amazing to me how teachers end up prioritizing the same things when they're successful teachers. You don't have to have necessarily the same vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You may not be grouping them exactly the same, but I mean, it's, it's essentially the same for you as it is for me and everybody else. We're teaching, we're trying to get people to control the ball it in the middle of the face with some power 
bottom out in the right spot. And if we do that, they're going to be successful. Now, off certain lies and, you know, in certain conditions, it requires adjustments. And those are skills that you develop over time. But it all works off the basic part of the swing, which is, you know, you're trying to work on constantly, no matter the level. You know, really good players are working on the same stuff as amateurs. They're just on a higher level of doing it. It's not like they're doing anything fancy. as They shouldn't be anyway. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so, and you get, I mean, you coach a lot of high level players and rightfully so you've developed a lot of high level players, which to me is important. That's a little different than someone just coming to you as being good. But, you know, uh, you know, one thing I'm kind of fascinated about, and if you don't mind talking about your daughter, you know, I know that's one thing that you really opened my eyes with is when we were talking about, um, and I don't want to say this wrong, it's Maddie, right? Yeah, it's Maddie. You yeah, so, it. so Maddie, when you were talking about how you were helping her and, you know, when she wanted to play college, I mean, you told me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were like, I just took her straight to the course. Yep, that's what I did. I mean, she was a, she played high school golf and was, you know, a very serious soccer player and a very good one. And then she got a concussion and decided to step away from soccer for a little bit. So we decided to spend the summer between her sophomore and junior year focusing a little bit on golf. And to fast forward that process, rather than take her to the range and beat a million balls, I decided I was never going to let her on the range. And so we worked every day on the golf course. We'd hit multiple shots from the same spot. We'd throw balls around the green. Basically, every single adjustment we, we made was on the course with a target rather than on the range without one. And it fast-forwarded her development significantly. By the end of that summer, she had already committed to playing Division One college golf. Now, she's a pretty talented kid and athletic. And obviously, she gets all that from her dad, for sure. <laughs> of course. But the idea is that I think people just really think they're going to discover the game on the range. And you really don't. I mean, the range, to me, is where games go to die. You know, so I want to get my players off the range as fast as possible. I want to use the driving range as a place to refine technique, to work on skill without any consequence so you're not worried as much about the result at the end. But ultimately, the faster you can get off the range and the sooner you can get on the course, even when you're learning, you're going to improve much faster doing that. Well, yeah, because, I mean, you just can't simulate the stuff on the range, really. It's so hard to do with all the different lies and situations and stuff. Um, you know, so, I mean, what do you think that, like, if, if you have a competitive player that's really trying to, you know, make it at a high level, I mean, where do you see, like, the younger kids or even the college players, you know, where do you see them kind of failing and how they're trying to prepare um, – you know, what are people, I guess, not doing that they could be doing to help them be more confident and prep for competition better? Uh, it's a great question. I think that there's a few parts going on. One is they don't really understand the areas they're not strong in. So, for example, if a player comes and says, I'm not a very good putter, and you'll say, well, what does that mean? You know, and it's like, well, I just don't make a lot of putts. I mean, that's not a good enough description for me to help that player. I need to know, are they struggling with speed on like putts? Are they struggling on making short putts? What type of putts around, you know, nine feet and in are they not making? Are they left to right, right to left? Are they not able to start the ball on the line they want? Are they, are they hitting it on the line and they don't have the right speed for that line? I mean, there's a lot going on there, and we need to know what's up so that we can work a practice plan out to specifically address that area. Once I've had a player – and I tell them what data I need, and then go play a few rounds, they can come back, and then we can look at it and say, okay, look, you're missing all the left to right putts low from nine feet and in. Let's go figure out if you're playing enough break or if you're just not starting it on the line you chose, and if we'll see what's up with the stroke from that standpoint, and then we'll give them a practice plan to address it. So there's that first step, which is what am I doing and how do I fix it? You know, and a lot of times people just don't know what they're doing. They don't know what's going on and why it's not working. And then the other part to me is they're not training with the two things you always want to train with. Um, I'll give you an example of that. My my player, Brandon Hagee, is on the tour. He's a member at Whisper Rock in, in Scottsdale where there's a ton of PGA Tour players. So Aaron Badley walked on the green one day, and Brandon said to him, Hey, Aaron, what do you? what's your favorite drill to do at a tournament? And he said something I thought was very profound, and I was ready to write it down, 
right? One of the best cutters in the world is going to tell you something. You listen. And he said, every time I practice any drill at all, I do it in my full routine and I do it with a consequence. So basically, I have to make X number of these in a row or I have to make a percentage of these putts before I can leave the green. And it's always with the full routine. So I think people just said, okay, I'm going to do two things differently from now on. I'm going to try and really know what areas I need to work on and, and how do I need to work on them. That's number one. And then number two, whenever I do practice, I'm always going to practice in my full routine and I'm always going to practice with a goal in mind of performance. You could really change people just by doing that without ever touching one thing in their technique. Well, yeah, because it starts to simulate what they do. Um, you know, and I'm always so fascinated. You know, I joke with people, like, I never would want them to do this, but I'm like, you know, most players, I think we'd be better off just stepping up and hitting a shot because that's how they practice. You know, very rarely are players disciplined enough to, you know, go through their process. And, and to me, really defining, you know, what you're thinking about more than just going through the physical motions, but really controlling your thoughts and, and really your emotions. And like you said, like with a consequence. So, you know, it does able to transfer a little better. Totally. It matters when you have something on the line and people don't practice with that nearly enough. And because they don't, they have trouble tra taking their game from the practice area to the golf course because all of a sudden there's stress and there's consequence and they don't train at that level. They train at a level that's much nicer. Right. And I would prefer all my players to train at a tough level. We want training to be really hard and, and that way they get on the course and it almost seems easier to them. Well, Brady, how much like how much do you feel like some of that is coaching? And you know, I I look back and kind of hit myself sometimes. Like I was that teacher, especially when I first started. When I was like, hey, let's let's kick out of trees, let's fluff the ball up. You know, I'm always giving them good lies and stuff. And you know, I look back, I'm like, God, I was doing nothing but like uh, basically curbing their learning experience by doing that. Yeah, you made it easier so they'd have more success. And, you know, with a player who's starting out, that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, we want those players to feel good about where they are. And, but with somebody who's trying to perform and play tournament golf, they've got to learn to hit it from all the junky places that they're going to hit it from. And if we don't practice those shots, then how can we possibly expect them to perform in a tournament when they've never really trained on their own? So we want to always try and ask our players to, to put themselves in tough spots, to have a consequence, to stay, stick to the routine, and then try and execute. And then they can really evaluate what happened if it didn't work out, or if they're just kind of going through the motions, who knows what happened, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, you're saying it's spot on. So, I mean, if you um, – you know, I'm looking at this like I know people who are listening to this and everybody's gone through this, but like, you know, and it's a thought out topic all the time is building confidence. I mean, you know, you've you've done such a great job, I think, of helping people overcome. And, you know, I feel like, you know, it's everything's kind of segmented now. You got your gurus and different stuff. I mean, do you really believe a player needs a sports psychologist or can you help them build that confidence in how you train and how they train? Yeah, I think honesty is really important, and I want to challenge them all the time. So I just actually gave a lesson today. I was working with a kid, and I, had, I wanted him to land a pitch shot from like 25, 30 yards in a certain 10 balls to do it. I said, how many balls are going to take you to do it? And he said, three. And I said, well, why did you say three? He said, well, I want to give myself a couple chances, you know, first. I'm like, well... You know, if you do that, you're just giving yourself permission to fail. I would just tell yourself, I'm doing it on the first shot. I'm going to do it. You know, you may not be successful, but if that's your mindset, that really changes your expectation level. You're expecting to be successful. Yes, it's a hard challenge. But I think you may not be successful, but the mindset needs to be on a very positive, I'm going to achieve this goal mentality, right? And then if they do fail after 10 shots, I'm not going to give them an 11th shot. I'm not interested in it. I want them to have, I want them to tell, to succeed or fail. Like I told him because he didn't get it done. And I told him, I said, well, you failed. That happens. And he was 10, he's 10 years old. 
And he's like, well, you want to hit another one? I said, you didn't get it done. It just didn't happen today. And that's all right. That's golf. You know, let's find another challenge and hit another target. And we'll go through it again. And I don't, I don't want my players to have sort of a false idea about, you know, that every single time they go play, they're going to have success. Every single shot they're hit is going to be perfect. It's not. You want to have that expectation that you can go achieve it, but you also have to deal with the failures. And I think as you do that and then you do have some successes, it's very hard to lie to yourself that I'm a better player than I am, right? I mean, that's not a good thing to do. And so I don't do it to my players. I want them to achieve success or have failure and then deal with it, move on, and get better, period. So I'm a big believer in being honest. I think that's important. Well, and, I, and honestly, I think that's that's something that you've totally, like, changed my game with and kind of made me rethink how I coach. And it's definitely changed because, you know, I almost kick myself at, at times just thinking about, you know, and again, it was more about me. And I'm just being honest about that. It was like, I wanted the player to feel good. So I felt like I gave a great lesson and, and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's not in the player's best interest. And I think, I think there's an issue with that along the way too, as coaches are trying to make themselves look better and, and, you know, instead of really helping the player and sometimes helping that player, you know, it might be ugly. Right. I disagree. I, I think you're dead on there. People do that. Teachers do that for their ego. It makes them feel good when their students succeed. But if you're, if you're making it too easy or giving them too many chances, they're really not succeeding. You're just doing it until they have a good shot. Right. So, that's probably not the best approach. It's much better if you say, look, here's the game. This is the rules. This is what you've got to do. And if you get it done, awesome. And if you don't, that's fine. We'll, we'll do it again next time. But I don't, I'm not going to give you another chance. I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you do it until you, until you win here. This is kind of the problem I think with a lot of us, you know, as parents and, and having kids be competitors in sports, everybody's getting a trophy and, Everybody is happy at the end of the day because they all succeeded, and that's not life. That's not athletics. It certainly isn't competitive golf. My goodness, you fail far more than you ever succeed, and that's okay. If you're going to play this game on a high level, you've got to be able to deal with that. So why not start dealing with it in practice? Man, that's such good advice. I mean, so, you know, if people are looking at this and like, how can I take this stuff and – you know, do something about it. So if a, if a competitive player, and that's, that's really who we're gearing this towards. I mean, I want to help everybody, but I'm, I'm trying to gear this more towards competitors that need to get better at managing themselves and training better to play at that higher level. Um, you know, how can they set up these practice plans, you know, like that? What's going to, I mean, I know discipline, you know, is going to stop them from, you know, just trying to hit that last one and, and get that shot of dopamine, I guess, that just makes you feel like you succeeded. But you know, how do you, how can players, like, what's you, how do you set up practice plans for players? Like, what's a Brady Riggs practice plan look like? Well, I mean, it's really specific to the individual, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, if we're on the practice area, let's say, then we have, I have a million different games and competitive games we play, but uh, I'll give you an example. One of them is, is called 100 feet of putts. So, uh, I, I stole this from Jason Goldsmith, who, who works does Focus Fan and works with Justin Rose and some other players. So he, he gave this to Brandon, and now I've taken it too. So that's us teachers, right? We're always stealing from each other. Yeah, sure. So, But it's 100 feet of putt. So you've got a 5-footer, 10-footer, 15-footer, and a 20-footer. You've got four putts, and you've got five putts from each distance. You're randomizing the break on each one. So some are right to left, some are left to right, some are downhill, uphill, whatever they are. And you have to make 100 feet on those 20 putts. So if you go through it in your mind, if you do the, if you made all the five footers, that's 25 feet. If you made all the 10 footers, that's 50 feet. Now you're at 75 and you're still 25 feet short of the goal. It's a difficult thing to do. And the reason why the 100 feet is the target is that looking at a lot of PJ Tour staff, that seems to be a, a typical number for a person who's winning a tournament each round, that they're making 100 feet of putt. Interesting. So we try to make 100 feet of putt, and it's in, it's in full routine, and it's with that consequence, and if you don't make it, you may make yourself, well, I, 90 feet is a pass, 100 feet is a win, anything less than 90, I failed, I've got to do it again. And so that's what I would do. And then if I'm there with my student and I'm helping them do the 
the drill, I'm, I'm making sure they're doing all the different breaks, but then as they get close and it looks like they're going to win, I'm trying to break them. I'm trying to tell them you suck. You're not going to make this. You're going to miss it low. I can tell it's getting to you. you know, I want to get in their kitchen a little bit so that when they do get in competition, they've already succeeded not only on the drill, but they've already dealt with me being a jerk, which is, which is highly motivational. Well, yeah, too. I mean, um, you know, cause some people will look at that and go, man, you're kind of being a dick, but you know, at the same note though, these are probably the exact thoughts that are going on in players' heads. Right. I mean, like how many people have that negative self-talk of, Oh, I suck. I blew this, you know, all that stuff. So all you're really doing is just saying it up, up front to them. Right. Totally. And no matter what I'm saying, I, I, I know a lot of people that are far worse on themselves than I ever am to them. And I'm, and I'm being a little nasty to them, but they're way worse to themselves, you know? So they've got to now deal with me and they have to say, you know what, that's not going to help me right now listening to Brady. That's something I'm just going to, I'm going to focus on what I'm trying to do. I'm going to be in my process and my routine and I'm going to try and execute no matter what he's saying. That's not helping me. I'm focusing on me. And really on the golf course, when you have a negative thought, that's what really should be going through your mind. You're not trying to ignore it. You know, that's not easy to do. You can't pretend it didn't happen, but you say to yourself those, those words, you know what? That's not helping me right now. I know what I need to do to execute here. I'm going to focus on this instead. But, if that, if you did that practice session, you're talking about 20 putts, right? You're in full routine. That's going to take some time. You know, that's at least 10, 15 minutes of time. And you're focused the entire time and you're concentrated and it has a consequence. Now, if you went out there with three balls for 15 minutes and just putted randomly, the result you're going to get in terms of improvement isn't even close to what you'll get if you do that other practice. It's not even in the same hemisphere. And if you're going to train and you want to be on an elite level, you got to train like a PGA Tour player. That's how they're training. And that's what you've got to do to get there. Man, that's awesome. Hey, um, have you ever, like, I mean, I, like, I love your story. So have you had a player that just really had a hard time just getting over that hump in competition? I mean, great practices, great on the course, and then get in a competition and just couldn't quite get it done. You ever have a player like that? I mean, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. It, it's Do you really have any a, cool, uh, like, uh, like a cool story about how you help somebody get over that. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you my daughter's story again that summer because it, it's we've already talked about it a little bit. So she had played about four or five tournaments as an individual before the summer began, and that was over the course of two years of high school golf. So hardly at all. And she plays a tournament. She shoots in the low 80s, whatever, 83, 82, something like that. And she plays another one, and she shoots 81. Well, I watched her play the round, and, I mean, except for I think she made two or three doubles and, you know, missed a few short putts. And, but you could tell the game was getting there, and she was really frustrated because she's like, wow, I feel like I'm playing much better than that. And I just told her, I said, I, I'm telling you right now, you're going to shoot in the 70s, and it's going to happen fast. And when you do that, you're going to break it by a lot. And she's like, why would you say that? I just said, and I told her, because everything is going in that direction. It's all trending right. You just, just relax. Go get it done. And the very next round, she shot 77. Mm -hmm. It was the first time she broke it in a tournament. And I think just sometimes helping people be patient, you know, understanding that it's okay if you're struggling a little bit. We're in no hurry at all. There is no rush. There's no timetable here at all. We're just out there trying to execute. And keeping people in their process and making sure they understand that there's no important round they're ever going to play right now. They're just out there to continue to improve. It takes all the burden off their game. You know, it makes this, it, it relieves them of the chains. They can really relax and play. People just get up tight and they, they really don't need to be. They just need to be staying in their process and realizing they got a lot of rounds of golf to play in their life. There's no need to be in a hurry. Man, that, that's good advice, Brady, because, I mean, that's a big thing I think especially kids deal with that want to play in college and stuff is they get that, that time kind of winding down on them and they get so nervous about their rankings and recruiting and stuff. You know, it's, it's hard to keep them chilled out about that, but, you know, you're right. It's like, you know, you just – I mean, when you can kind of relax and just be yourself and not be fearful because, I mean, really, don't you think that all boils back down to fear? You know, just fear of what if, what if I screw up, what if I play bad? Totally. They're attaching their self-worth to the score. Yeah. You know, they're attaching all the work they've done to some arbitrary score and not all 79s are the same. You know, some are really good. And some feel real bad. And I think 
you know, people need to just let's have some different goals. So I always like, I never as a coach have ever asked a player after they play, what did you shoot? I don't ever ask that question. They're going to tell me in good enough time. My first, my first question I ask is, did you stick with your routine? That's the first thing I want to know. And then I want to ask them, did you hit some shots the way that you wanted to today? Did you execute some shots? And then the conversation will always end up going into, well, I made a bogey here or whatever. But I think it's important that you don't put that pressure on as a coach. We're not, we're not attaching the score as an indication of how well you played or didn't play. And that really helps them kind of realize that I have a different goal. My goal is not the score. My goal is, is how they executed what we tried to work on. And if, if I'm saying that, and then I got to get the parents to say that and the parents not to ask that question. Then the kids start looking at it that way and saying, you know what it is? It's not really about the score. It's about how did I do? And, and we both know that if they execute the other stuff, the score will come with it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's such good stuff, Brady. Um, you know, so what, like when you talk about sticking with your routine and stuff, I mean, what is the importance of a routine to you? Like, what does a good routine entail, I guess, is a better way to ask that question. A good routine puts your – it connects you to the target. It connects you to the shot you're trying to hit. It, it stops you from being in a space that's technical or internal, you know, thinking about what you're trying to do with your swing, and it starts to connect you with the external, which is the shot I'm trying to hit, the shot I'm trying to create. What does that feel like to me, that sensation of hitting that shot? And my routine is supposed to help me get there faster and get there more often and, and, and kind of help me focus on that and not all the consequences of not achieving it. And so it's practiced, right? I and mean, we work really, really hard with my players on, on their routine. I want to know it inside and out. So when I see them in an event playing, I can tell whether they're in it or not. You know, and we, and we use focus band to help with that too sometimes, which is great. I love the focus band. And I just think that people, if they can, if they can ask themselves that question, which is what does a good shot look like? You know, what is that going to look like to me right now? And then they try to have a practice swing that feels like it would create that. They hold that shot in their mind and the sensation of what it took to create it. And they walk in and they hit that shot. That's, that's in a successful routine right there. Whether you executed it or not, it's, it's whether or not you can get in that space before you hit it. Because we've all been there where we know we're going to hit a good shot before we hit it. And we know we're going to hit a bad shot before we hit it. And we want to get our players in that mindset that I'm going to hit a good shot, I can tell. And, and if you're doing that, then your routine's you know, helping you play better golf instead of making it harder. So would you say that players are going to perform better when they're not technical over the ball? I think players, I mean, every once in a while, you'll, I, I've always had a, I'm a, a swing key kind of guy, you know, as a player. I've always had a thought or whatever that is. But I've tried to now, as a player, take that further from my actual swing and put it in my practice swing before I hit the shot. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, so I, I'll put it in that space, and then I'll be aware of it in that space, and then I want it to just carry over naturally to the shot I'm hitting. But, yeah, if you're thinking about backswing positions during the swing on the golf course, good luck with that. Well, That's not going to work. Right. And, yeah. I mean, I've been there. I mean, a lot of people have been there. And, you know, so my, sure. my, my problem, too. yeah, I mean, my problem, Brady, is like, you know, again, though, I look at the state of golf instruction, you know, and I've been fortunate to be at some awesome summits with you around great coaches and teachers. But, I mean, like there's so much tailored to technical, 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 and then, then – you know, then we turn around and go, okay, like, you know, don't be technical over a ball. You know, I think it's just a lot of that's confusing for players. But so again, I mean, that's why I was telling you, I wanted to just get on. I love talking with you guys about this stuff and, you know, trying to clear this up for people and really get them to understand how to perform because that's a tough thing. I mean, don't you think? I, I do. And I think, you know, what's really interesting to me is that these summits that we go to, there's some very smart guys and some really good stuff going on, but, a lot of the time, the guys that are giving the talk at a summit are more researchers than they are teachers. Mm -hmm. So if you go listen to Scott Hamilton give a, 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 a talk or a presentation at a summit, here's a guy who teaches a bunch of tour players. He's not going to sit there and give you some long technical 
presentation. He's going to talk about how he gets players to perform. That's a guy I want to listen to. Right. I might not agree with some of the things he's trying to get players to do. I, I'm not saying I don't, but it's not really what he's talking about. He's talking about how do I get players prepared to play? And if you go to a guy who spent his entire year in a gears lab, you know, he's probably not the guy you want to talk to about performance. Mm-hmm. He's worried about horses and torques instead of worrying about, you know, birdies and pars and bogeys. So it's really just, you know, there's different people coming at it on different angles. And I think they're all important for helping us get players to be better players. But I want to listen to the performance coaches, the guys that actually teach good players, that develop good players, because they're the ones that are getting the job done. You know, the lab guys don't interest me a whole heck of a lot at this point in my career. I've already been down that road, and I know that it doesn't really matter that much. Yeah. So, you know, Brady, I don't want to keep you forever, and I I really appreciate this again. But, you know, so one thing is, I mean, do you have, like, just one great – Anthony Kim story. I got to ask you. Sure. Of course I've got, I've got a million great Anthony Kim stories, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give you a great one. Well, just, just real quick. Sort of what, was your, what was your relationship with him? Just so we can fill everyone in. Um, I, I've known Anthony since he was seven. He grew up practicing a lot at the golf course I teach at. Um, I've worked with Anthony on a swing, but I would never say I was his coach. That was Adam Schreiber, who was a fantastic coach. Um, but I knew a lot about Anthony Swing, having recorded him in, on video for years and years and years. And I think Anthony's great. Anthony, uh, it's, it's a shame he's not playing because he was so good for the game. He was so mm-hmm. fun. No, no but doubt. Anthony was, Anthony was the one guy who I could never talk trash to and get him off his game. It would only make him play better. So I learned early on not to talk to Anthony because you'd lose badly if you did that. <laughs> So anyway, we're, we're playing a two-man kind of a team game over at Sherwood, and Anthony is – he's got a 30-footer on the last hole for a lot of money. I can't even keep track of all the skins going on and, and all these different games these guys are playing. So one of the guys in my group was really fun, great trash talker, and he was standing right next to Anthony as he's hitting this putt. So Anthony looks up at him before he hits it, and he, he looks at him – and he says, this is going to hurt a little. And proceeded to roll in the 30-footer for all the money. And that was Anthony. I mean, put him in a spot where he had to step up, you know, where he had to execute. He was amazing. I mean, Anthony didn't really care about the trophies. It was never part of his deal. Anthony, Anthony played golf well when he was playing for spikes, when he just didn't like the guy. That's when he was at his absolute best. So the game missed AK. He was fantastic, and I miss watching him play because he played with just a, a total bravado that you just don't see very often. He was fantastic. Yeah, it's it's definitely missed for sure. I mean, he was one of my favorites, and you know, I mean, that was that was a good era of golf. I thought. I mean, we had Anthony and Tiger was killing it, and you know, I mean, it was it was right. yeah, it was good stuff back then, but. Hey, man, I don't want to take any more of your time. I really appreciate you coming on. This is some awesome stuff that I think is very, very valuable. And, um, you know, it's just, like I said, I just think this is a real problem in the game, you know. And, just, you know, talking to you and having you on that side too is, you know, makes me feel a lot better about it too. But, um, you know, I just see some of that stuff, like you said, some of the stuff we hear at the summits, and I, I kind of scratch my head. I'm like, man, you know, it's – just, I just don't think that's 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 it. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm I'm saying like I don't think that's going to help anybody perform better. So I mean, you've given a lot of good information, a lot of good stories. So I really, really appreciate it, Brady. Hey, my pleasure. I know you're doing a great job, and you're really making progress with your players, and it makes me proud and happy to see that happen. You know, I think the more of us that teach players how to play better and not swing prettier the better people will play. Well, and, and I think we're always going to see them separate themselves when they do that. Yeah. Just real, real quick last, I, I, I know I said I'll let you go, but you know, I was just thinking about that Maddie story. I mean, so if you, if you really had to do it all with everybody, I mean, would you just keep everybody on the course? I mean, would you do it everybody like you did with Maddie? Yeah. If I had that kind of time, you know, cause I obviously dedicated time to go out on the golf course with her for a few hours, you know, two, three hours a day working on shots. 
Yeah. I mean, if I had my way, I would, I would let players warm up on a range. That would be it. That would be it. I would not be spending, I certainly wouldn't be plugging in electronics. I'm not interested in that. I think we can all understand ball flight without it. Mm -hmm. I would be, I would be giving them great fundamentals and basics for them to check. And then I would teach them how to play the game on the golf course with targets and not worry about, you know, sitting on the range with the sticks down and track men going for hours upon end. I don't think that that doesn't create a special player. You got to get them on the golf course. So I, I think that's good advice for parents too, though, is like with parents that are trying to help their kids instead of being on the range and trying to tell them what they're doing wrong with their swing, you know, just get them on the course and throw them in situations kind of like what Earl Woods did. hundred percent, man. It's, it's, it's true in every single sport. There's a line, I think, you know, I coach soccer, I've coached it for 20 years, and we have a saying, which is, the game is the best teacher. And I really think it is. You know, the more they're on the golf course playing, the more they're learning. If you get a target and you're trying to hit a shot, it doesn't work, and you can work it out on the next shot, that's, some, that's two very valuable shots. If you hit those same two shots on the range, you have no idea whether they worked or not. No clue. Hmm. Well, again, Brady Riggs, I appreciate it. I'm going to let you go. Uh, actually, just hang out really quick here. But uh, for this purpose, um, I appreciate everything, man. You're the best. Thanks, dude. Thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah.